So uh, today I'm going to be talking about photoemission theory for electron sources. And um, as most of you know, photoemission is really a quantum mechanical process. So uh, any kind of photoemission theory does require some background in quantum mechanics. So if you don't have a background, uh, any background in quantum mechanics, it may be difficult for you to follow the talk in its entirety, but I think you will still be able to get uh, some important messages out of the talk and uh, I, I hope you'll still appreciate the talk. Um, photo emission is a fairly complex mechanism and it's a fairly complex phenomenon and it was uh, discovered or uh, put forth by, well, not really discovered, but explained by Einstein who won the Nobel Prize for it in, in 1921. And since then it has been used for various things. The first application, the most important one I would say is photo emission spectroscopy where uh, you shine UV light or X-rays on materials and you study the angle and energy of the um, uh, electrons that are emitted or photo emitted to figure out what the electronic structure of a material is or what the composition of a material is. And we had a nice ped pedagogy talk uh, last year by Professor Kyle Shen about ARPES and uh, in general photo emission spectroscopy. And in my view, uh, this has been the most dominant uh, application of photo emission thus far. Another application of photo emission is photon detection, which is essentially photomultiplier tubes and night vision goggles where you detect infrared or uh, other wavelengths of very uh, other wavelength photons. So they're, they're incident on a very high efficiency photo emitter and you eventually detect the electron that's emitted because of the photon. And the final application is what we as a center focus on that's photocathodes or electron sources. Um, where you have a, elect, uh, a cathode or a, a photoemissive surface in a strong electric field and uh, you, know, in, you have light incident on the cathode, electrons are emitted and you accelerate them to form an electron beam. Now, a lot of the theory that was developed for photoemission sources, for electron sources, has really been adapted from uh, the theory of photoemission originally developed for photoemission spectroscopy. Uh, since photoemission spectroscopy is by far the most well developed application of all of these, uh, the theory for photoemission spectroscopy is also much more mature. And any theory that we develop for electron sources has been adapted from the, uh, the theories developed for this application. And in this talk, I'll go, up, go over some of these photoemission theories and Towards the end, I'll talk about how the photoemission theories for electron sources should differ from the photoemission theories that have been developed for spectroscopy. Now, uh, before we go into the theories, let's take a quick look at what we require from photoemission electron sources to understand what are the properties we really would like to calculate. And the requirements, of course, base uh, vary dramatically based on what application you have, whether it's ultra-fast electron diffraction and microscopy, or are you looking to use them for free electron lasers or electron coolers or particle colliders. But generally, the most important application for, uh, sorry, the most important figure of merit is uh, obtaining the lowest possible MTE or the mean transverse energy which uh, most of you know by now what mean transverse energy is. But for those who don't, it's really just the average kinetic energy of the photo emitted electrons in the direction transfers to the beam propagation. You can think of MT as just the RMS transverse momentum spread of electrons or as some sort of an electron temperature. And in general, the lower is the mean transverse energy, the higher is the brightness. And hence, uh, as a center for bright beams, we care about generating the lowest possible mean transverse energy. The other requirements that are peripheral to the mean transverse energy, and for some applications, they're really the most important requirements, are the quantum efficiency, how many electrons you get per photon, the response time, how quickly the electrons are emitted, the spin polarizations, whether the electrons are spin polarized or not, and how robust is your cathode, for how long can the cathode last without degrading. 
and in uh, 2017 jared uh, gave a fantastic pedagogy talk which has more details on the various requirements and uh, i would refer to that talk for more details but uh, as an overview the mean transverse energy and the quantum efficiency are really the things that we would like to calculate from a photo emission theory for uh, photo electron sources now uh, going into the various theories we have for photo emission the most accurate or the quantum mechanically accurate model for photo emission is the one step photo emission model which says that photo emission can be explained as a quantum mechanical transition from some initial state to some final state under the hamiltonian of incident light and one way of formulating this or calculating this transition rate is uh, simply by using the fermi golden rule which uh, comes about from the first order time dependent perturbation theory where this transition rate this wfi is the transition rate from some final uh, from some initial state to some final state under some hamiltonian uh, so you calculate the overlap integral of these two states with a certain hamiltonian of light and of course you have a delta function which gives you the conservation of energy the energy difference between the initial and final state is equal to the photon energy now uh, let's take a closer look at what these initial states final states and the hamiltonian what do they look like now um, in the transverse directions for uh, that's the direction parallel to the surface if you have a perfect crystal the initial and final states are essentially proportional uh, to e to the power i uh, kx and uh, similarly the final state is also proportional to the uh, e to the power i kfx where the k is the uh, transverse wave number or in other words the transverse momentum um, and this is true for a perfect crystal which does not have non uniformities you can essentially describe these wave functions as plane waves in the transverse directions the longitudinal part of the wave function is much more interesting the initial wave function is a kind of like a, it can either be a block state in the crystal which are the standard bulk uh, oscillatory states that you would have in a crystal and they decay in vacuum because the electrons in a crystal are confined to the crystal or you can have a surface state which uh, in which the electrons are really concentrated very close to the surface and the wave function decays into the surface and also in the vacuum the final wave functions uh, are essentially free electron wave functions in vacuum when the electron is emitted it's a free electron and that would give you the oscillatory free electron wave function in vacuum however in the crystal you have a wave function that some combination of a block function a surface state and a decaying and also has a decaying part to it and the decay often is sort of an artificial decay that's introduced to account for light absorption or scattering of electrons so now when uh, and finally we look at the hamiltonian the hamiltonian is the hamiltonian for incident light which uh, is simply uh, given by this expression where p is the momentum operator and a is the vector potential for light and it also has some oscillatory component to it now when you calculate this overlap integral with all of these wave functions a very interesting property uh, comes about and this integral is simply just integrating uh, these wave functions over all of space you get some component in the uh, longitudinal direction and the transverse components are given by e to the power kx i uh, minus kix minus kfx and when you integrate these terms over all of x or over all of y you end up getting a zero unless the initial and the final momenta in the transverse direction are identical and this is what uh, leads to this um, rule of uh, conservation of transverse momentum during photo emission which is one of the key things that we look for um, or one of the important aspects of photo emission on which uh, all of photo emission spectroscopy is based and this is something that we try to exploit for obtaining low uh, mte2 now um, 
as far as electron sources are concer concerned, we like we are interested in quantum efficiency and the mean transverse energy. And uh, the quantum efficiency can simply be obtained by uh, summing this transition rate from some initial to some final state over all possible initial and final states. And uh, of course, you have a factor uh, of the Fermi function to account for the occupancy of electrons in the initial state. So if the electrons are not, if the initial state is not occupied, that will contribute to zero and divided by the number of photons and you get the quantum efficiency from uh, ab initio kind of uh, techniques. Uh, again, the mean transverse energy is a similar calculation except the numerator is now normalized by this uh, transverse momentum square. Uh, and there are some factors to convert from the transverse momentum to the energy. And the denominator is simply the total number of electrons that would be emitted. Now, uh, so from these two equations, uh, one can see that reducing the mean transverse energy really requires using materials which have this overlap for which this overlap integral is large only for wave functions which have a small kx and a small ky. So you want to have this overlap integral to be large for wave functions which have small kx and small ky. Uh, and that will end up reducing your mean transverse energy. And loosely this really translates to emitting from low effective mass states in, uh, um, uh, sorry, in a, a particular band structure. So if you have low, and that's the reason why we search for materials which have low effective mass and hope that they will give us the low mean transverse energy. Because for low effective mass states, you have um, small kx and small ky, and you can still get a large overlap integral. Now, uh, one example of this thing, uh, of this one-step model when applied to electron sources was done for the silver 111 surface where uh, the surface has a surface state. Uh, the figure on the left here shows the projected band structure of silver onto the 111 direction. And the red line here is a surface state and the shaded red region are the bulk states. And since this is a projected band structure, the um, region ends up, the bulk states end up being a shaded region instead of just one line. Um, if you apply the formulations that I just described, you end up getting a really good match between the theory and experiment. So here, um, when you end up emitting from the surface state, you end up emitting with a low transverse momentum states and hence your mean transverse energy ends up being low and the overlap integral for the surface state ends up being quite large and you get a fairly large quantum efficiency even at low mean transverse energy. So this is uh, an interesting example of how you can exploit band structure for getting a larger mean, a lower mean transverse energy without losing the quantum efficiency. Now the one step model that I just described, which is a fully quantum mechanical and a uh, ideally, it's a fully accurate model of photoemission. Is uh, uh, it's a, it's a really most accurate. It's a very accurate model, but it's really often computationally infeasible. It's extremely hard to actually calculate these overlap integrals for all possible electron states. Further, if you start including uh, complexities like phonon interactions or electron scatterings or surface roughness, it ends up becoming impractical to use this model. And uh, also obtaining the response time, which is also one metric we evaluate cathodes on, we require them to have a short response time or a quick response time, is it's very difficult to extract the response time from such a one step model. And therefore, in many cases, uh, people end up using what we call as a three-step model of photoemission, which is uh, it's uh, some sort of a phenomenological model which ends up working. And in this three-step model, photoemission is described as a complex process that involves three steps. The first step is excitation, and that 
is excitation of electrons from an occupied state or a valence band to an unoccupied state or the conduction band in the crystal itself. And this excitation process can be modeled in a way that's very similar to the one-step model, except that the, both the initial and final states are just bulk block states of the crystal. Um, now, in excitation, in such an excitation, you can also include uh, multi-photon transitions or uh, transitions due to multi-photon absorption and um, uh, many body transitions that involve many bodies like uh, phonons and photons sim and electrons simultaneously. And this is something that Tomas Arias and uh, Kevin Nangoi have done within our center in the last few years, which is uh, quite exciting for us. The next step is that of transport. So once these electrons are excited into a higher energy state, they are transported or they move around in the crystal. And once they hit the surface, they can be emitted. And the transport can be modeled in various, modeled in various ways. You can model the transport in a completely quantum mechanical way or you can model it in a semi-classical way. And if you model it in a semi-classical way, you can um, uh, really incorporate all sorts of scattering mechanisms the, of electrons scattering with phonons and other electrons or other charge carriers uh, uh, during transport or as they move towards the surface. And these mechanisms cause them to lose energy or change their momentum. And this has a big impact on emission. And the final stay, uh, process is that of emission. So the electrons that reach the surface are either uh, emitted into vacuum or they can get reflected uh, because it's a quantum mechanical transition. And in such an emission process, you can also include effects of surface roughness or with either complete in a classical way or a quantum mechanical way. Now, thus, this three-step model of photoemission is much, uh, it's a more versatile model and it can be used uh, for a broad, much broader range of materials. Uh, the details of what you include in this model and what you don't, what uh, scattering processes are included or what excitation processes are, are included, uh, really depends on uh, the material that you're trying to model. And hence the uh, details of this three-step model really vary a lot from material to material. Uh, but in general, the three-step model gives you a uh, nice shell to model your, um, to model the pro photo emission processes. And you can really account for the various complexities that, are, uh, that go on during photo emission. Now I'll go over uh, two examples of three-step model being used for modeling cathodes. The first one is uh, where we have modeled uh, three, five negative electron affinity cathodes. So three, five semiconductors, when there is a film of cesium placed on the surface, the uh, vacuum level uh, drops below the conduction band minimum. And hence any electrons that are excited into the conduction band uh, and reach the surface just pop out into vacuum. And uh, therefore, these uh, materials also have a very large quantum efficiency. And when you apply the three-step model to this particular uh, cathodes or this particular family of cathodes, you end up exciting electrons from the valence bands or from one of these three valence bands into the conduction band. And in the conduction band, these electrons are tracked in both the real space and in the momentum space. And as they scatter around with uh, different phonons and with other charge carriers, they move or they change their direction in real space and also change their location in the band structure in uh, the momentum space. And then those electrons that come to the surface have a finite probability of getting out. And in such a way, you can really account for the various processes, uh, the various complexities that are that happen during the transport in uh, the photo emission process. And all of this, it's really impractical to account for in a one-step photo emission model, which is pedagogically a, uh, the more accurate model of photo emission. The other uh, three-step model uh, has been used to describe polycrystalline metals um, uh, as electron sources. 
And in a polycrystalline metal, it's really difficult to define a band structure as such. And hence you end up assuming that the electrons are a, uh, essentially a free, elect uh, they have, a, you have a free electron gas in, uh, inside the metal. And the electrons from this free electron gas are excited. And as they move towards the surface, they can scatter with other electrons and lose energy dramatically. And if such a scattering event occurs, the electron loses enough energy that it wouldn't get out into the vacuum. So once the electron scatters with other electrons, you simply ignore those electrons. And only those that reach the surface without any scattering end up getting emitted. And in such a case, you can get a nice analytic expression for the quantum efficiency and the mean transfers energy. Um, here, this expression looks quite complicated, but really this part is to account, the first part is to account the reflectivity. The second part is to account for the fraction that survive, fraction of electrons that survive the transport process uh, without scattering. And here you have the fraction uh, of electrons uh, and angles at which they are excited or moving that are allowed to escape. And in the denominator, you have all the excited electrons. And this ends up giving you the quantum efficiency. And uh, it, this expression really simplifies to, um, uh, as the Q, uh, simplifies to a much manageable expression. And it gives you that the quantum efficiency is roughly proportional to h bar omega, that's the photon energy minus the work function and the square of that, which we also call as the excess energy. And if you calculate the mean transfers energy from this expression, you get the uh, famous relation that Dave Dovell had put forth, uh, which is uh, the mean transfers energy ends up being proportional to one third of the excess, or is ends up being equal to the one third of the excess energy. And as the excess energy goes to zero or as the photon uh, energy goes to the uh, work function, it, the mean transfers energy ends up becoming KT, which is the temperature limit that we often observe in cathodes. So these are uh, the two ways this three-step model can be used effectively to describe photo emission in uh, crystal, uh, sorry, in electron sources. Now, uh, finally, uh, you know, I said before that a lot of these theories that we have for photo emission have been uh, adapted from for theories developed for photo emission spectroscopy. But there is one important difference between uh, the nature of photo emission for photo emission spectroscopy and for electron sources. The, in photo emission spectroscopy, most of the electrons that uh, people care for have a kinetic energy of one EV or larger. Whereas in electron sources, most of the electrons that are emitted and that we care for have a kinetic energy in the range of a few to 100 milli electron volts. How does that affect photo emission? Uh, in all of these photo emission theories, both for spectroscopy and for electron sources, there is a subtle approximation called as the sudden approximation, which basically says when the electron absorbs a photon and is emitted, the moment the electron is emitted, it moves away from the surface fast enough that it does stops interacting with the surface instantaneously. And while the surface when the electron moves away from the surface, the surface is left in an excited state, which, uh, and it relaxes slowly back into the ground state. And we assume that this electron stops interacting with the surface as the surface is relaxing back down. Now, if you think about it, um, if you cal or, and if you calculate the time required by an electron to move one de Broglie wavelength, and plot it versus the kinetic energy of the emitted electron. For electrons with kinetic energy of one EV or greater, this time is really less than a femtosecond. Um, and in such a case, you can really justify the sudden approximation that in one femtosecond, nothing changes in the surface. There's, uh, I say, you can treat the surface as essentially stationary and the electron moves far enough away from the surface to not interact with it anymore. However, as you lower the kinetic energy, you go into the few tens of milli electron volt regime. The, this time for an electron to move one de Broglie wavelength is few hundred femtoseconds and the electrons are relatively really slow. Um, 
in this case, you can really expect the electron to interact with the surface quite a bit as it's being emitted. And uh, you can expect a sudden approximation to fail, which is uh, one of these, uh, it's a subtle but a foundational approximation in all of the photoemission theories. And this is something that uh, needs to be explored, whether this approximation holds true or not. Uh, one of the reasons that we have this approximation was uh, that people have never really measured electron distributions in this range of a few milli electron volts or few tens of milli electron volts. But now we have the ability to do that and we, we are planning to explore the validity of this uh, assumptions within CBB and it's going to be an exciting time for uh, um, uh, uh, just, a uh, just studying the physics of photo emission at these low energies and perhaps we will end up finding a new regime in photo emission and also photo emission spectroscopy while we are studying this. Now, as a conclusion to the talk, you know, we saw how photo emission theories that we have for electron sources are really adapted from photo emission spectroscopy. We went over this one step model of photo emission, which is uh, pedagogically a more accurate model, and a three step model of photo emission, which is a more practical model that. Uh, allows us to take into account various effects uh, or complexities in photo emission. And uh, finally, we saw some new effects that are possible in photo emission electron sources, which may require new theory development specifically for photo emission electron sources. And uh, with this, I would like to take any questions that you may have. I have a question, Sid. Yep. Um, uh, have you done any work on um, uh, sources that have a reduced number of dimensions, like uh, like nanowires or quantum dots? Uh, there is some work on um, such sources out there. And again, it really relies on the three-step model. And if you look at it, you can, that essentially modifies the excitation and the transport part of uh, the three-step model, right? All you need to do in excitation, if you have a quantum dot, you, have, uh, you don't have a continuous, you don't have continuous bands. Instead, you have discrete bands. And you need to modify your extend, uh, excitation accordingly. Uh, again, the transport, varies in a similar way. You probably will have to do a fully quantum mechanical transport for a quantum dot. Um, and uh, the transport may have to be combined with emission for a quantum dot just because of its reduced size. Um, in two dimensions, there are uh, for uh, layered structures, there has also been a work done that again uses the three-step model in a similar way. Oh, Thanks. Uh, I did have a follow up, which was just that um, the emittance of those reduced emittance, I would expect maybe like a quantum dot would be closer to the, it might have a broad spread of um, transverse momenta, but its emittance will be, you know, as low as you could possibly go. Uh, that's an interesting uh, question, which is a little debatable. Um, you know, the quantum dot, the issue with quantum dots, so one of the good things about quantum dots are the discrete states. Like you have only discrete energies that you can excite to and you could in principle tune your wavelength such that you cause only one excitation and you have really monochromatic electrons within the quantum dot. The problem is when they get emitted, a quantum dot typically has various facets. It's not a nice single crystalline surface as such, right? And it's extremely difficult to predict which facet the electron will come out of. And uh, this facet, uh, depending on which facet it comes out of, the momentum spread or the energy spread increases quite a bit. Um, of course, you do restrict uh, uh, the location from which you are emitting if you have if you are emitting from a single quantum dot 
but then you also do increase your energies and momentum spread significantly. So it's a debatable topic whether it will overall help or uh, uh, or help uh, help or make your emittance worse compared to a flat surface on which you can focus light down to a micron or sub micron spots. Cool. Thanks.